Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Insights, the series powered by the Digicel Foundation. I'm your host, Terry Carell, and I am a proud partner of this initiative. Before I dive into this interview, I just want to stop and say thank you. Thank you to everyone who has watched the videos, who have shared the episodes, who have commented, who have encouraged us, who have told us that they absolutely appreciate the series and that you want to see more. Again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to not only create an awareness, but we actually want to create an inclusive society. So it's okay to spread it, but we actually want to see you act upon it. How can we be more inclusive? Are we being more inclusive? These are the questions we always want you to ask yourself. So it is an honor, naturally. I've spoken to two persons already, Sir Sean Harvey, then I spoke to Altira, the 14-year-old. So you might be wondering, you know, so who coming next, right? Well, it is a pleasure to have in the seat today the Honorable, I call him the Honorable, Senator Dr. Floyd Morris. How are you, sir? I'm very happy to be with you again, Terry. <laughs> One thing with you, you know, you're always sharp. <laughs> always sharp. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I don't intend to cut you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and, and thank you for all the work you do. So I, I just mentioned one of your titles, but for persons who don't know, you're director of the U.S. Center for Disability Studies. You are an advocate whenever we speak about persons with disabilities. We're speaking about policy, legislation, where people with disabilities are concerned. You are an author, I think a three-time author. I have two Mm -hmm. of your three books, yes. uh, by, by Faith, Not By Sight, which is a, a memoir of so sorts, uh -huh. as well as um, an inclusive education. Those are the two I have, but I know uh -huh. you also wrote on cultural right. inclusion, right? right. Um, so before I even get into all of your accolades, what makes you very different from the other two individuals I had the pleasure of interviewing is that Sean Harvey, who spoke very highly of you, by the way, mm -hmm. um, was born blind. Mm -hmm. And I believe off camera, he also said that his parental units or one of his parental units, of course, is also blind. Mm -hmm. Altiria, who is 14, was born prematurely and as such her sight, the development of her sight um, wasn't complete. Mm -hmm. You are very different because having read your memoir, you had sight mm -hmm. and you had sight for a good while before you lost it. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what that transition would have been like for you and many individuals who had sight once but lost it for whatever reason. It was a very traumatic experience, you know, because just imagine uh, growing up in your childhood years where you play cricket, mm -hmm. you play football, you play marble, you play dandy shandy, you play hopscotch, you play dog and bone, yes. and you go to the river and you swim in the deep holes and you catch um, mullets and all of those things. And then you find that over time you have to stop doing those things because mm -hmm. your sight is deteriorating and the football and the cricket is something that you now have to listen uh, and hear about rather than participating. Mm -hmm. And so it was an extremely traumatic and frustrating endeavor, you know, and especially after I left high school in 1986, between 1986 and 1989, when I went totally blind, it was a hellish experience, mm -hmm. you know, because you have to just sit down at home and just wait for the moment to come. And I mean, 1988, I watched the uh, clouds of Gilbert, uh, just uh, cascading cas um, across the mountains and the winds blowing. Um, and that was the, the last of nature that I you experienced, experienced, you know? Um, and then 1989, I mean, 
the site went totally. And I remember it. I remember you you indicating and expressing in your book, you know, um, especially because of, of, of the school, um, the school on the hill. Mm -hmm. um, and you always spoke about the mountains and just the beauty and all of a sudden everything started to get very, very hazy. Yes. Were you ever in, I don't want to use the term denial, but having sight all this while, did you fully understand what was happening and that it was going to be something that you could not change, it could not be treated, it could not be turned back? Well, you know, I think the doctors at the University of the West Indies are pre had prepared me very well for the inevitability mm -hmm. of uh, um, the losing the sight, you know, because they told me that if the pressure was not controlled in the eyes, then ultimately I was going to go blind. Mm. And it was a very difficult experience in terms of the doctors controlling the pressure. Mm. And so I, 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 I was preparing myself for it, but it's not a situation that you can be totally prepared Careful. for, mm -hmm. you know, because you're born with this thing and you're accustomed to a particular way of life. No, it means that your entire life was going to be changed. Mm -hmm. You are going to be living in a world of darkness. Mm -hmm. That is what your life is going to be. You spoke so about I say that I am king of the dark. Now. You're king of... <laughs> I love it. You just completely owned it. You said earlier that it was it was hellish, you know, the transition and this feeling of having to wait, this feeling, of course, of having to learn this new environment and naturally understanding that our society has never been one that embraces mm -hmm. or accommodates or facilitates, for that matter, persons with disabilities. What are some of the challenges, like the real challenges that you faced that might have been hellish back then, but have somehow helped to shape who you are as an advocate, who you are as a man today? Well, you know, I mean, I start with when I was going blind and in high school, you know, my grades fell significantly. I mean, I used to be in the top 10 uh, performers in my class. And once the side problem came, the grades just fell. And there was no support in the school system uh, to deal with mm -hmm. that particular situation because teachers were not trained in how to relate with a person with a disability. And then, I mean, uh, having gone uh, from school and now confined to home, the problems that I had in my community where individuals were jeering and uh, <laughs> mocking and, you know, calling me all sorts of names mm -hmm. uh, was another uh, experience. And then when I came to Kingston to get uh, rehabilitated at the Jamaica Society for the Blind and wanting to restart my uh, education, the problems that I had first getting into Campion College evening uh, classes, uh, the problems that I had on public transportation, the problems that I had navigating the sidewalks, the treacherous sidewalks mm -hmm. of Kingston. All of that was some of the hellish experience that I, I have encountered and it has assisted me mm -hmm. in uh, how I have made my transition and also assisted in my advocacy and research work where persons with disability are concerned. Sir Floyd, do you think, do you think society gets it? All the persons who have the power and the authority to make the change within their companies, their businesses, within the school environments, the churches, the different ecosystems, do you think they even understand that their actions or inactions actually help to perpetuate um, these hellish experiences for people with disabilities? I mean, I don't think they, they have gotten it. They might be getting it. Mm. but they have not gotten it. Mm. And notice the language that I am 
using because for them to get it means that we would have reached a point where there is acceptance and appreciation mm. of disability. Mm. We have not reached there, but there are progress being made. And I say they are getting it because with an institution, for example, like Digicel mm -hmm. and its foundation from Digicel came into Jamaica, I think it was um, 2002, 2003 and started the operation. They immediately embraced the disability agenda. And I remember having discussion with them about employing persons with disabilities. Which they have and, done. And they mm. have done. And they just take on the disability project like that. There are other companies in the society that are doing their thing. And we see now where we have reached the point where legislation is in place. Mm -hmm. So some things are happening, but we still have that negative attitude towards yes. persons with disabilities. And we're not going to see that change, overnight. radical change taking place overnight because we have had what I regard as over 300, 400 years of negative attitude and behavior towards our persons with disabilities. And I'm going to use a big word for you. <laughs> you know, the, the, the attitude and behavior towards persons with disabilities have become habitualized in the society. Yeah. So, you know, everything that you see out there is a cultural transition that takes place. It moved from one generation to, to the their next. next. And that is why we say it has been habitualized in the society. And we have to make sure that we change those negative attitudes Absolutely. towards persons with disabilities. You wrote the book, um, Inclusive Education, which I have read, um, mm -hmm. and it gave us real practical steps and mm -hmm. examples. Because I think a lot of the times when persons think of creating inclusive environments, they think, oh, it's either going to be super expensive, it's going to be a lot of work, a lot of resources. And I think what you were able to do is to pinpoint areas and to pinpoint how you know practical things can be done that can help to improve um, the system. Mm -hmm. uh, what improvements, just for our viewers' uh, purposes, do you think we can make? I know that there are some schools that are a part of the integration process. So you have students who get their education at the Salvation Army School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, who then transition into like a Calabar. There are other schools that do that. What are the other areas that where we need improvement in the education um, education system? Well, first and foremost, we have to realize that Jamaica is a signatory to the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And Article 24 of the convention requires that mm -hmm. our educational institution be as inclusive as possible for persons with disabilities. This entire uh, convention is anchored on an inclusive environment. So we have to make sure that our educational institutions mm. have teachers that are trained to relate with persons with disabilities. We have to make sure that our educational system, the physical plant, must be accessible. You know, wheelchair access for uh, wheelchair users, mm -hmm. bathroom, toilet facilities at schools Counter must heights. Mm -hmm. be accessible. And we have to make sure that there are support staff members to assist children with disabilities in that educational space. So teacher assistance, you know, for our children who are deaf children, who are autistic children, who are wheelchair users, children who are blind and mm -hmm. in that educational space going to need additional uh, support. And we have to make sure that the technological so so support mm -hmm. is also there for these uh, students. You see, people must understand what the thing about a person with a disability is that your eyes might be blind, not your brain. Mm -hmm. Your ears might be deaf, not your brain. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that these individuals have the capacity to perform and participate 
in that inclusive education space. And that's one of the things that I will be relentless mm -hmm. in my pursuit in terms of tearing down the barriers in the educational system in Jamaica to make sure that it is more inclusive and uh, accommodative for uh, students with disabilities. Listen, I just want to pass the offering around the room and say, listen, you're not listen. <laughs> but it's facts. One, um, to echo what um, Sean Harvey said, because he said he finds it quite laughable, and he's quite a character. He said he finds it quite uh, laughable that persons who can see somehow believe that um, intellect and intelligence mm -hmm. are reduced to you being able to see. Yes. The fact that if you can't see, all of a sudden it means that you can't think, you can't critically think, you can't assimilate, mm -hmm. and that echoes what you you just said. Um, I think number two, apart from having accessibility for the persons with disabilities, I think what the general society needs to also know is that if you've ever met a person with disability, they do not want sympathy. No. They do not want pity. What no. they want is for you to acknowledge their basic human rights Absolutely. and allow them to self-actualize. And my daughter, thirdly, um, I think it also, the integration is important from an early age mm -hmm. because a lot of the times we overlook that as persons who can see the world is centered around us. Mm -hmm. We are the center of the universe and therefore we have our unconscious biases that we're not even aware of. Absolutely. And because I expose my daughter, who is now 11, mm -hmm. but she's been exposed to persons who are blind. She's been exposed to persons who are deaf. She's learning sign language right now. She's been exposed. She mm, asks questions. Wonderful. Thank you. She asks questions like, Mommy, so why don't I see children with wheelchairs in my school? Uh -huh. And so it's important for allies mm -hmm. and advocates to also right. be people yes. who don't have disabilities, but who can also go in rooms and speak about the rights of, of others. I think it has to be a, a collective um, effort. Yes. What say you? Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and that speaks to the Hope Valley experimental uh, project that was initiated from the 1970s to have children with disabilities integrated in the same educational space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as those without a disability. I mean, if we had aggressively followed through on that program, we would have been further ahead mm -hmm. in Jamaica. You know, um, we, 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 we have students with disabilities in the classroom, but we have not followed up with the subsequent adjustments to the educational plant mm. in terms of access, in terms of the technological support. I tell you, any disability that you have, you can find the technological fit to, to support. help support that type of disability. When people see the amount of work that I have been able to do at the University mm. of the West Indies. I mean, I, I, I became a staff member um, of the university in 2010. Yes. And uh, that was just to coordinate the Center for Disability Studies. But by 2018, I became a full-time staff member and lecturer. And since 2018 and now, I have had the equivalent of over 25 peer-reviewed um, publications. Uh, and that has been made possible mm. because of the technology that I have at my uh, disposal. And once you empower and enable that person with That's disability. It. That's it. Yeah, man. Give them room. Give them space. Uh, is what we say. Lego the bird. Lego the bird. Lego the bird. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So let us get down to let's get down to brass tactics. You have been someone who don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk. Mm -hmm. And for you, it's never been, oh, you know, making space for people with disabilities is a nice thing to do, but it must be done. Mm -hmm. So let us look at legislation. February 14, for many people, it's celebrated as Valentine's Day, but for me, it is Disability Act Day. Mm -hmm. It came into effect, well, February coming will make it two years. The mm -hmm. government gave us two years. How successful do you think we will be in enforcing it? That when we look at landlords who have been given two years to make sure that the living facilities can also accommodate tenants 
with disabilities, that companies will not just hire people with disabilities, but infrastructurally will also be able to facilitate and accommodate persons with disabilities. Coming 2024 will be the second year in which people would have been given enough time. Talk well, to me about the enforcement. Well, and I will tell you, they have had far more time than that because the legislation was passed in 2014 mm -hmm. when I was president of the Senate. And it was there uh, for a while until uh, the implementation date, the effective date for the legislation was set for Valentine's Day uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, when I, as I traverse the society, I see a whole lot of work that we need to, to do. do. I mean, when you look, go into parking spaces, people still parking in... In the accessibility. Accessibility mm -hmm. parking spaces for persons with disabilities. I, I mean, recently I heard of a student with um, disability who passed for a prominent high school in uh, the city not being able to get in that school if it wasn't for the intervention of the said ministry that has that responsibility to uh, make the school accessible. But at, uh, they would have known that this child has a wheel, uh, is a wheelchair user mm -hmm. and no preparation was well, made for the child. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we, 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 we still have a lot of persons with disabilities who are unemployed. I mean, the last research that we did in about 2015 uh, indicated that 90% of the respondents mm -hmm. unemployed. And I don't think that anything has happened significantly to dent that number. And so we have a whole lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. But the work, you're not going to uh, get the transformation overnight. taking place overnight. And that is why at the United Nations, where I sit on the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, we talk about progressive realization, meaning that, you know, over time, we are expecting to see the changes taking mm -hmm. place. But what must happen is that government along with civil society, must have a roadmap that is going to take you to a particular destination in terms of achieving the an that you inclusive desire. society. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Well said. My final question to you, I mean, I could sit down. The reason why I love speaking to you is because <laughs> I learn a lot. Uh, I don't think we should ever stop learning. Um, yes. And for people who like to learn from the same people who look like them, sound like them, act like them, speak like them, they really don't learn anything outside yes. of their core group. Um, I, I'm sure as viewers are listening to you speak, and you, you're speaking with so much passion, just like um, Sean Harvey, and we're hearing about the different roles and the responsibilities and the titles that you have held and that you continue to hold, um, roles that put you in a position to effect change. For anyone who is watching, any individual, whether born blind or currently losing sight, um, whether they have parents who are also trying to figure this out, because for them it's a transition as well. Mm -hmm. How do they stay on track? How do they continue to self-actualize despite the world telling them that they are defined and reduced to their disability? What, what would be your words of encouragement, using yourself as an example? Uh, well, I must tell you that Sean Harvey is one of my mentees, and I'm so proud of him. And you Stella. know, he Stella. is a solid uh, young man. And when I, I don't mean to cut you, sir, 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 sir Floyd. When I spoke after I spoke to Sean, mm -hmm. and we came off the set, I look at the cameraman and the rest of us who were there, and I say, well. I've never felt so basic in all my life for being able to see. Mm -hmm. Sean made me walk off said, feeling like, hey, listen, <laughs> being blind was a superpower. Yes. And speaking to you yes. and Altiri and these different persons yes. who are showing you how it's okay to live out loud and live out your dreams despite 
your, yes. your, your disability is, is, is inspirational. But please continue. Yes. Sorry to you know, you. I mean, I tell people, you know, that they must understand that having a disability is not a crime and it is not a death sentence. And today, the world, the society is changing mm -hmm. in terms of its attitude towards persons with disabilities and systems are in place with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, with the legislation here uh, in uh, Jamaica. There are legal safeguards mm -hmm. to protect and empower persons with disabilities. And there are technologies that are there to uh, empower and assist persons with disabilities in their uh, pursuit. So if it is that you want to be a doctor and you have a disability, you can still be a doctor. I mean, mm -hmm. we have had a young lady just graduated from Norman Law, Manley Law mm -hmm. School uh, as a lawyer, and she is um, uh, visually impaired, you know. Um, we have a, 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 a young man who graduated from the university with first class honors and he was cerebral palsy, um, you know. So anything that you want in life as a person with disability, you can achieve it. You have to accept your disability mm -hmm. and accept that that is a challenge and that the society is not going to be totally friendly with you. But if you keep on pushing, mm -hmm. if you keep on pushing and when they say no, you say yes, yes, sir. and you press, yes, sir. and you press, and that's why I get into problem with some of my people. I mean, but I don't care. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, they want to place a limitation on me mm -hmm. and what I can do and cannot do, and I say, how dare you? And I decide that I am going to press. I am going to press. Just give you room. Give you yeah, room. And, and just like how one popular TV station say. Just look at me now. <laughs> Senator Floyd Morris, I thank you. Thank you for being a, a breath of fresh air. Um, but, but also thank you for being that policymaker because we can talk all we want to talk mm -hmm. if we don't have it there mm -hmm. in legislation that we can use as legal support. Then really, we're just, it's just a bag of chatting, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for all the work that you do in Jamaica, within the region. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for being that voice and for teaching the rest of us how we can also be advocates and how mm -hmm. we can also be allies. And I, and, I, and I will always say that if we have an intolerant society that continues to treat people with disabilities um, with utmost disrespect and disregard, it says more about them than it does yes. about the persons with disabilities. Yes. Um, and, and we have a lot of work to do. And it will be uncomfortable because nobody likes change, but it is absolutely absolutely necessary i thank you for your time uh when is the next book coming ah well you know i'm working i'm on, keeping up i'm trying I'm to keep working, up with you i'm working on two uh, book projects at the same time there is one that i'm looking at the healthcare system in the uh, caribbean or it's a research project and that is at pre it's at press now and then i have Basic. an extension of my autobiography Can't wait. coming that is entitled why i kept my pen um <laughs> i can't wait i can't wait don't give away too much don't give away too much but so, you know there's a lot of work you know a lot of work just yeah. another interviewee here on insights making me feel very basic and an underachiever. Congratulations <laughs> on everything um, you have done. Congratulations on everything you continue to do. We can only hope that we can be half as great um, as you are. Again, viewers, I don't know about you. I've been enjoying this series. It's Insights powered by the Digicel Foundation. I've been your host, Terry Carell, a proud partner of this initiative. And again, we don't just want you to like the video or just to comment or subscribe. We actually want you to share it with your community and then insist on asking the questions. Are we doing enough? Are we comfortable with what we see 
and what we are doing. It has been yet another great conversation. Senator, it is always a pleasure seeing you. I hope we get a cut away with your shoes and people them can see. <laughs> Not only are you bright, <laughs> but man of taste. All right? <laughs> but thank you so very much. And we will see you the next time as we have another conversation on Insights. Yes. Be good. Yes.